Hi, I'm Jerome Nesbury, president of the New Pi Chapter of Omega Psi Phi Fraternity Incorporated. And I'm Shamil Tillery, president of the Chicago Metropolitan Alumni Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. We are so excited that you've joined us for our presentation for World Prematurity Day. All across the world on November 17th, people stop to recognize the health and wellness of mothers and babies born prematurely. We're excited that on the 111th Founders Day of Omega Sci-Fi Fraternity Incorporated to collaborate with our brothers of the New Pi Chapter to present the Coleman Love Story. Our founder, Frank Coleman, married his love, Mary Edna Brown, one of the 22 founders of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. And together, there was a journey of what many here Omegas and Deltas call Coleman Love. Tonight, you will hear the true Coleman Love story and the connection of the importance of maternal health and wellness as well as infant mortality. Omega Psi Phi Fraternity is proud to stand with Delta Sigma Theta in support of physical and mental health on World Prematurity Day. We hope that you will be inspired to join us and donate to the March of Dimes as they continue the research, advocacy, and financial support of families of preemie babies. Coleman Love's story starts on the campus of Howard University in 1909. Frank Coleman met Mary Edna Brown as they were part of the historic freshman class. Brown and Coleman took many classes together, but they were also acquainted outside of class in many extracurricular activities. Much like Frank and Edna meeting during college years, we introduce you to our first couple, Phyllis and Julian Wooding. I am Phyllis Wooding. My name is Julian Wooding. I pledge at the Capital Sigma chapter celebrating 85 wonderful years. Lane College, Jackson City, Physical Fifth District in the year of 2002. I pledged at Murray State University in the Eta Upsilon chapter, spring of 2005. And this is in Murray, Kentucky. I pledged because of the influence that my father had on me. I saw my father pledge in the year 1988. Him and his live brothers do projects together. I saw him and his live brothers lined up, stood up together. Growing up at the Fry House on 47th Street, I got to meet a bunch of influential men around the Chicago land area. A lot of people who have who I who know me since I was born. Once I got to college, I got to see the brotherhood and the service, and I got to see me and Bond and run the yard and have a great organization. And that's what I came on that. My influence is my mother is a member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. She also pledged the Eta of Swine chapter spring of 1972. My aunt pledged Alpha Pi chapter in 1969. I always grew up seeing them do service and work for the sisterhood. And then um, in the year 2000, Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated had a national convention <laughs> in Chicago. I was in high school. I just remember like all of my aunties coming and cousins and like a lot of my mom's like friends and um, Sora's and everybody was just coming to Chicago. So I'm like, oh, I'm excited. Like, oh my God, I get to see everybody. I get to see like my aunts and stuff. And they're all members of Delta Sigma Theta. And it was all fun and games until they descended upon my house. <laughs> <laughs> they all stayed between my Aunt Rhonda Whiteside, Aunt Dr. Rhonda Whiteside, her house, and then my house. And I just remember like, we don't even have enough room for all of this. And my mom's like, we have enough room, it's fine. You're going to have to get up to that bed. And so, um, that I ended up like seeing like really what 
the sisterhood is um, when even when you don't have enough space, you make the space, you make enough space, you make room uh, for your sorors and um, your family. So they're always going to be like an extension of your family. So we were at the NPAC picnic um, here in Chicago um, at the Darren Woods. And um, I just came home from college, this is in 2007. I did link up with my distant fans, Jessica Mason, and she pledged to spring 05 Beta Chi chapter at Lane College. She sees Julian and she introduces us. She's like, oh, Phyllis, this is one of the bras from my yard. When I found out he pledged at Lane, you know, the bras um, from my yard, they're in the same district, which is uh, the fifth district. So I'm like, okay, so it's kind of like seeing somebody from home. Like, you know, somebody who pledged in the same area. And then we just became friends. I'm telling Jessica, like, you know, I like him. He never comes and talks to me or whatever. He's telling her, like, I like her or whatever, but I'm, you know, I don't know, whatever. Also telling everybody in the free world that he's going to marry me. Mind you, he has not taken me to get a fish dinner yet. So, <laughs> yeah, 2014, we were at Sora Aston Hayes, her picnic. That's when me and Julian started talking, it started raining. He stole somebody's umbrella to cover me with it. Um, and then we went to go walk on the, on the lake and we talked and he asked me on the first date and the rest was history. I proposed to her 2016 going into 2017, he is a little black pearl that was a party corner. So her ass that was a part of her. So she got the tickets for me for the party and um, so we got to the party. So I get I pull ass to the side and say, hey, what can I, you know, what's a good spot we can do? They say, come on, we don't go to the DJ booth. So, all right, I'm gonna go to Phyllis the DJ booth. So Phyllis going to the DJ booth like sweet, we VIP. <laughs> Zero clue. And then it might the DJ said, hey, I got my man's wanna do this. And I, I got on the microphone, I said, Phyllis, we ready. I got down on one knee and proposed right there. Frank and Edna were very influential in their family members becoming members of both Omega Psi Phi and Delta Sigma Theta. Grace Coleman, Frank's youngest sister, would become the president of Alpha Chapter. Edna's sister, Elsie and Helen, would become members as well. Edna's brother, Sterling, would become a member of Omega Psi Phi. The influence they had on their family is still a driving force today. Meet the Andersons and their uncle, Cleavon Davis. My name is Deandria Anderson. I'm Terrell Anderson. I'm Cleavon Davis. I pledged in uh, 1975 on the campus of uh, Lewis University and held several positions on the undergraduate level and continue to hold positions at the graduate level now. Well, the first time I pledged was in 1975 with Uncle Cleavon. <laughs> he pledged Omega Psi Phi. He was the only person in our family in college at the time. And I used to go and visit him on the campus of Lewis University. Because I was a young girl, I had to stay with his girlfriend, who was a member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. And those Deltas took very good care of me. So I kind of stayed with them around the campus. I did a little bit of service with them. They were amazing and completely influential in my life. And because of the exposure that I had at such a young age, I've always wanted to be a Delta. I pledged Chicago Alumni Chapter in the spring of 2003. Well, when was spring 1997? I went to Central Michigan University. There were some parties, you know, on the yard during that time. The men of Omega were not, you know, at that point. So I continued to you know, go through my journey of college and then eventually graduated. I, I encountered more men of Omega. I ended up meeting uh, my wife. I met uh, Cleveland Davis. You know, coming back and forth from Detroit to Chicago during that time and of course learned quickly that he was a man of Omega. So he was also a major influence in terms of my decision. I was in graduate school at Wayne State in Detroit working on a PhD in economics. Terrell was working for what was then MBD. I went to a party, he came to a party, to that same party after coming in from work. A friend of mine was trying to dance with him. I was watching the Bulls and the Pistons in the playoffs. 
ultimately we ended up talking. I did give him my number. <laughs> And the next day, we talked the entire day, and we did not stop talking since. I never thought I would meet my wife at a club. It was a club in Southfield, Michigan, uh, called Nichols. I'll never forget that. And my friend had to drag me out because I was exhausted. You know, I'm like, take me home, take me to my apartment. I don't feel like going out. But he convinced me to, to go. Well, and I got married April 7th, 1996. Yes, our daughter is a Delta. She pledged to Alpha Chapter in 2016. And our son is a man of Omega, April 16th, 2022. Both Frank and Edna were model students of their class. Edna graduated magna cum laude and was the valedictorian of the class while Frank graduated cum laude and the only person in their class receiving a Bachelor of Science. After graduating, their paths led them in different directions. Edna went to receive her master's at Oberlin College in Ohio, while Frank went to North Carolina to teach and head the science department at Bricks Agriculture and Normal School. But in the fall of 1914, they both landed back in Washington, D.C. to teach at Howard Academy. It was clear that the sparks from undergrad were reignited then. However, Frank would head to Chicago to start his coursework towards his Master's of Physics at the University of Chicago. These model students were paving the way for those like Dr. Elliot and Dr. Felicia Forte. So I'm Felicia Davis Forte, MD. I'm Elliot McKinley Forte, MD. I was made at National Convention in 1977. I am a model initiate, um, and the model initiates were where they went around the country, Delta went around the country, and they saw women that they thought best exemplified what a Delta should be. And I was an undergrad, I was a junior at the University of California, Irvine. We didn't have a chapter there. And um, some of the influences, since I was a little girl, I wanted to be a Delta. Um, when I was maybe in the third or fourth grade, I um, had to do a report on uh, influential organizations. You know, you had the encyclopedia back then, you had Jet, you had Ebony. And I went through these magazines like left and right so that I could write this uh, paper. And so I was so excited. I was like, oh my God, there's this one organization and it just stands out above all others. I told my parents, I said, I'm so excited about writing this paper. I went over the paper with my mom. And then she said, oh, have you ever seen anything in the closet? No, I didn't know what she was talking about. She opens the closet and she pulls out a paddle. She pulls out a paddle of hers and a paddle of my dad's. And that was my first real true introduction to Delta Sigma Theta. Let me see, I played September 29, 2007 at uh, Sigma Omega Chapter here in Chicago. My uh, influence was primarily my sponsor, Dr. Everett Scrappy White. So uh, we met uh, about September of 1995 at uh, CCPA, that's Cook County Physicians Association networking event. I uh, developed a friendship uh, that became deeper and uh, somehow, I don't know exactly when the sub subject changed, but it did. And, uh, and here we are as far as that part. I just couldn't, like I said before, I couldn't stop talking to her. So we got married in August of 1996. And um, yeah, and then we had our son, and then two and a half years later, we had our daughter, who's now Delta. By 1917, the United States was close to entering World War I. Frank had submitted his application and was one of 200 African-American men who was qualified and accepted to be an officer in the United States Army. After just four months of training, he would become a first lieutenant. Frank would be assigned to Camp Meade, Maryland. During his time off, he would spend time with Edna and they would become engaged. Frank would soon find out that he would be sent to France to fight. So the couple were married on Saturday, May 28th, 1918, and Frank was shipped off to France just three weeks later. 
Edna was also active with her war efforts as she became a lieutenant for the American Red Cross. After eight months of fighting in France, Frank returned home and the newlyweds would soon be expecting a child that would be born prematurely. Meet our newlyweds, Jabari and Jorian Saunders, who will share their story as Jabari is no stranger to premature birth. My name is Jorian C. Saunders. <laughs> Jabari Saunders. You know, I pledged at uh, New Pi Chapter, Fall of 20, the Service City Classic down in Indianapolis. And being down there, was able to see, you know, all the D9, you had the bros, the alphas, you had the Kappas. I remember walking in with my family and I was just like, Mom, Dad, who, who, who are they? And of course, we would go to different um, football games and universities. And so that was when I was very young, but then I was still intrigued and got to see and experience and understand that I actually had family, Godfather, who also came through the chapter, um, Paeta. Um, you know, I got to see what true manhood was. I got to see how brothers, the brothers of the fraternity, how within the organization they truly held themselves to a high standard. And so by that, it allowed for me to, you know, kind of try to start to align myself with how they moved, how they operated, how they walked in, you know, continue to learn more and more about the organization. So um, I crossed the Chicago Metropolitan Alumni Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated on April 9th of 2022. So the reason why um, I chose to pursue my organization is because when I think of a Delta woman, and this has been from the outset, I just think of a woman who stands for something and uh, doesn't just fall for anything and um, a woman who is about sisterhood, a woman who is a leader um, in the workplace, in the home, in the community, um, and just a mover and shaker, you know, a, a strong woman. Um, and of course, I wanted to um, be like that, be like that when I grew up and um, when I had the opportunity, I was like, wait, you know, so that's why. So Jabari and I met, um, I 12 years ago, um, through mutual friends, his best friend and, or childhood friend and, and one of my best friends are now husband and wife, but at the time they were dating, so they would have events and we'd be there part of the crew. Barbecuing, right. DJing, friends, I'd be DJing, completely I mean, friends. just hanging out. Hanging That's out. And um, then St. Patrick's Day weekend in Chicago, you hang out. So we were hanging out and he had just moved back here um, in 2018, St. Patrick's Day weekend. We were hanging out all day. All day. And, and then we hung out all night. <laughs> <laughs> we just hanging out. We just hung out, you know? Um, and the, now we're married. <laughs> the rest, is, the rest history. is history. We've been hanging out ever since. Uh, you know, my daughter, um, she was born prematurely. She, um, I mean, two and a half, almost three months. You know, and so it's a time where you can't do anything. You really have to sit back and, you know, pray, be with your family, support. Um, but you really have to just trust and believe that things will be totally fine. When I saw her in uh, the NICU, um, cooking, if you will, uh, you know, getting her superpowers. Um, it was difficult. You know, I, you know, I was, when my daughter was born, I was living in, in, in Beaverton, Oregon, Portland, Oregon, um, working for Nike at the time. And then I flew home, uh, you know, I'll never forget, tried to book a flight because it obviously it happened abruptly. I'm in panic mode. I'm driving to the airport trying to get the first thing smoking out. It's at the end of the night and I can't fly out and then, and I get there and then I see my daughter for the first time. I'm just like, wow, it's beautiful. And she, I remember picking her up and holding her for the first time. And no lie, fit in my hand, just literally from tip to my wrist. Um, she weighed two, two pounds, two and some change. Um, it was just, Man, okay, this is where we are. But 
um, through God's will, through a lot of prayer, my family being there, um, you know, seeing the strength of her and, you know, seeing that happen and come to fruition. And I mean, it was, it was tough to be around. I don't even really talk about it too much, honestly. And it was tough to be around at the time, but luckily I had friends who were there. I had also friends who also had um, gone through that as well. So they were there to kind of support and let me know, hey, things are gonna be okay. Um, and sure enough, they were. You know, she's a strong little super girl um, that's doing amazing things. Um, you know, seven years later, it's, it's funny how fast things kind of of all but just knowing where we were from the beginning and seeing um, you know her um, you know growing to that it is just amazing and um, you know I got to see the, the growth and the development and feeding her through a, a little tube and um, being there allowing her to you know have that skin to skin contact and you know feeling her heart beat against mine and just kind of being in rhythm with her and that was an experience and I'll never forget just holding her for the first time outside of where she was sleeping in, which I, you know, that little incubator. There's no feeling you can really describe it, but I think when dads first have that child and they hold them for the first time, it's that feeling. And that's what it was. And I'm like, oh, you know, you know thousands of miles across the United States, that's not an easy task is being a father and I'm very much someone I'm gonna be there for my children. I want to make sure that I'm there they can, you know, see and feel and touch and so my parents were both there and I wanted to make sure that I was there and I wasn't dropping the ball. But there were times where I was like, man, I'm not doing enough. Like, do I need to go back? Do I need to, you know, and so but you know, the thing about it was, you know, I was kind of doubting myself in some moments, but you know, I had some family that was just letting me know like, no. You're, 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 you're doing okay. You're doing what you need to do. You're handling business both here and you're handling business for your daughter. And, you know, she's going to know that you're around. And so I think that, you know, as we got older and, and seeing that, I really understand what that means because we ain't dropped Mr. B. You know, she's daddy, daddy, daddy. You know, there, there's nothing that, you know, was impacted by not being there on that Thursday versus being there on that Saturday. You know, there wasn't anything that was missed. And, you know, thankful our mother held it down, um, you know, not being there and also the family members and all those things. They were able to do such, they were able to do those things. And, um, but that's the strength in the family, you know, and, and coming together um, and someone may not be able to. And I, I'm thankful for that. And then when I was here, it was like, I got it, like, let's roll. Like, it was a great, great feeling just kind of getting back and just kind of rejuvenating my energy too. Frank was not as lucky as Jabari. On September 25th, 1919, Edna passed away after delivering their baby girl. And that glimmer of hope was extinguished because just 22 hours later, the baby passed away as well. There isn't much knowledge on what happened to Edna or the baby as the technology and medical expertise did not exist in those times. But here is Melanie Martin Ware, member of the Chicago Metropolitan Alumni Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, who will introduce our experts who will talk about maternal health and the disparities that plague the African-American communities then and continue to be issues today. Hi, I'm Melanie Ware, a member of Chicago Metropolitan Alumni Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, and tonight I am excited to be here this evening for World Prematurity Day with two very phenomenal doctors in the city of Chicago who are also members of Delta Sigma Theta as well as Omega Psi Phi Fraternity Incorporated, Dr. Vanessa Foster as well as Dr. Pierre Johnson, who are experts in their fields and will share with us about maternal health, um, advocacy, and all things that have to do with premature births. Dr. Foster, welcome. Thank you for having me. So I'm Dr. Vanessa Foster, ob for 20 years now, practicing on the south side of Chicago, my favorite place in the world. I pledge Gamma Iota, Hampton University, spring 1990. So, Dr. Pierre Johnson, born and raised on the south side of Chicago, aka the Fibroid Slayer. Um, follow ones I see, Xavier University of Louisiana, 
Um, I have been practicing uh, OBGYN for the past nine years, graduated residency in 2013. Awesome, we are so glad uh, to have you here. So tonight, CMAC and the new Pi chapter of Omega Psi Phi Fraternity, we are presenting the Coleman Love Story. We're telling the true story of our founders. Um, so one of the reasons why we wanted to sit down with you um, professionals is to just kind of um, talk to us about uh, maternal health when um, our founders were married, were on their journey of parenthood. Um, so very unfortunate things happened. What are some of the things happening back then uh, that you still see now today as it, as it relates to premature uh, birth and uh, maternal health? Premature birth in African-American women today, I can't quote you stats from then, but today the premature birth rate for African-American women is about 14 and a half to 15%. For a Latino woman, it's about 10%, and for a white woman, it's at about 9.2, 9.5%. So the incidence of prematurity for a black woman, when you correct for a socioeconomic class, for education, for insure group, it's still higher than our white same match counterparts. Mm -hmm. And back then, women who have the unfortunateness of um, dying during birth, um, some of those things are still happening today. So what are some of those contributing factors? So there are several different contributing factors to it. Um, so number one is access. Uh, so there's a common mistrust of the medical system well, where, where it should be um, because of the you know substandard care that we as a people have have received uh, throughout the history of this country. Because of that, there have been a multitude of different stories that have been passed down from generations to generations to now. Um, there is uh, a stigma of women going to prenatal visits and care. Not only is the stigma there, but also the access to adequate prenatal care. Um, where if you look at you know a major metropolitan city like Atlanta, which has is like a desert for OBGYNs. Um, to, and for women to get access to adequate prenatal care. Um, and when you add into the fact that, you know, we already have a higher propensity for hypertension, diabetes, because of the socioeconomic factors of our diet and, and our living circumstances, add all of those things in, you have, you know, just a melting pot for, um, you know, disparities in maternal deaths as well as infant deaths because of, you know, all of those things. Springboarding off of what Dr. Johnson said, the access to women's health care is greatly decreased because at least in the city of Chicago, multiple labor and delivery units are closing because a large portion of childbearing age women use Medicaid and Medicaid doesn't pay well, departments are losing money, okay. so departments are closing. So the access becomes even more disparaging because women can't get to it. Mm -hmm. And I find that so women rely on, they rely on the internet. It's a dangerous place. It's a dangerous place to gather the information from. Mm -hmm. They rely on their internet, the internet, and they rely on their girlfriend. Mm -hmm. Women are coming to get prenatal care later in their pregnancy. Mm -hmm. When things could be addressed early in pregnancy, they're getting there later in pregnancy. There's an overall mistrust, um, even among my African-American patients, to me, an African-American woman, there's an overall mistrust. So those trends make it difficult to get through that. You know, and, and so, you know, as I was saying, just like with Atlanta, Chicago is no different. Like, you look at the south side of Chicago, which is predominantly black, you look at the number of actual places where women can get prenatal care and actually deliver their child. It's nothing. Mercy Hospital was one of the only or the last ones and that was just closed so there's no value um, because the the finances aren't there so and, and the patient population that we're serving so there's there's just no emphasis on um the change of actually looking at uh you know what's going to impact health and and, and natural or, or healthy pregnancies uh, the trust issue you can look at COVID as a prime example of yeah. how we have gained such a mistrust for the system that we don't even trust our own, you know, so doctors like us went out, you know, and we stay rooted in our community. We stay rooted here. We don't go sell out to make more money. We go, we stay true to where we live. Mm -hmm. 
um, where we're from, and even still, there's a distrust and you know a lack of listening for better terms to us trying to teach about you know what you need to do to have you know not only healthy pregnancy but healthy lifestyles um over you know overall so it's just you add all of those things and then then you just look and see all these statistics that pop up over the internet black women dying in pregnancy mm-hmm. black babies dying in pregnancy but it's 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 a um it's a culmination of all of the things that we're mentioning um, that have to be addressed. And I'm glad you guys brought up um, the, the subject of COVID and, and the vaccines. Um, so I really would like for both of you all to speak about, um, you know, it's 2022, um, it's two, we're two years in. Talk to us about um, pregnancy and vaccines. Um, you know, they're, like you said, we're, we're looking at the internet, we're looking at the dark internet, we're talking about um, so many different pieces of information, but you're the professionals. What can you share with us with regards to um, COVID and vaccines, um, pregnancy, and how that transforms um, the journey? So, I mean, for me, like, you know, people can say a lot about what they read on the internet and what people have told them, but until somebody's actually seen a mother die in front of them, Mm -hmm. to somebody literally saw a woman that uh, was 36 weeks pregnant, had uh, just horrible COVID um, symptoms and disease. She had her lungs just ravished. Um, I mean, to the point where when you intubated her, uh, really, well, she had to be intubated because she just could not breathe on her own. Um, she they had to deliver her via C-section. That woman who lived for one week was able to hold her child once and pass, right? So, and that's a, that's a child that will not have a mother due to COVID. It's not because of any other factor. We're talking a healthy 30-some-odd-year-old woman that under any other circumstance should be living to take care of her child died in front of me because of COVID. So when people are telling me, you know, it's, it, it doesn't exist or you don't need the vaccine, you know, these are people that have never seen this happen before. Mm-hmm. So when you talk about doctors that have actually been on the front lines watching this happen and you want to talk about arguments about vaccines and what vaccines do and what vaccines don't do, you have to really understand what is happening, right? And when you are um, looking at the disease, vaccines are just arming you so when the disease actually comes that you have some type of defense to it. It's not making it so that you will never get an infection. So people will have a misconception of, well, people with vaccines still get COVID. Yes. That's a fact, that's right? A it's, not, it's not a shield. It's not like a Teflon guard where, you know, anything just starts bouncing off of you because you have it. You can get it. The point of the matter is you're not going to die from it. COVID is, the COVID vaccine is your seatbelt. Right. When you're driving, you wear a seatbelt. Right. That doesn't mean you don't crash. It means you don't die in the crash. Right. Mm-hmm. It's just a seatbelt. So, you know, and it's, 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 but instead of, you know, we've been doing this for half our life, you know, in, in, libraries studying and hospitals taking care of people you know actually knowing that having the knowledge of having the experience to be able to teach our people and then people that with absolutely no knowledge that google want to argue with us about you know things that we know and, and things that we're very confident um in teaching i'm not going to tell anybody that i wouldn't tell my own family my own mother my own children right so i'm not going to tell somebody to go get a vaccine that i don't take my children to go it's a very keen mistrust of the medical system, which we understand why it should be. But when you actually have someone that looks like you, that comes from where you come from, that actually have went through the ranks of learning and information to actually serve you and to educate the community, you have to have trust. You have to have some trust in somebody. You know? And both of you all have brought up you know, the whole trust factor. What are some of those things that is contributing to the mistrust? I've been told, they what are some of those things? They say to me all the time, I've done my research mm-hmm. and I have to correct them. You did a Google search. Correct. You did not do a randomized controlled trial study. Correct. That's research. You did a Google search. And your Google search has nothing on my degrees, on my board certification, and on my 20 years of experience. So we could talk about it, mm-hmm. but when I try to steer you in the right direction, you gotta you gotta come along the ride with me because this is what I do. And another another problem is is that you know 
some of it is valid because we have so much bad practice that still exists. Yeah. Right. So there aren't many people that look like us. The system is designed to keep it that way. You know, we make up 13% of the country, but less than 5% of every professional workforce, whether it be physician, lawyer, engineer, whatever, we are designed to be marginalized, not only in the communities, but also in these professional spaces. So with that being said, you know, people that are going to the doctors aren't seeing a lot of people that look like us. And I witnessed firsthand doctors that don't care about patients, doctors that perform bad medicine on black and brown people. Um, so there is a true and, and genuine mistrust that should be. But with that being said, we urge every patient, right, to, yeah, if you're gonna do your research, do your research on your doctor. Right. Yeah. Right. So if you if your doctor looks like you, it's from the same place that you're from. And then when you look at every aspect of their life, they're they're sacrificing to give back to their communities. Those are the people you need to trust. Mm -hmm. You know, social media is a powerful tool. Use it to your advantage. So if I, you know, if somebody is going in being an OBGYN or whatever profession that they they are, they should be that should be reflective in their social media platforms. It should be reflect, reflective in their life. You can't lean on Auntie, somebody said, or my sister's cousin, such and such said, or Google said, right? That's just not, you know, you wouldn't do that to, if you had a court case, you wouldn't do that exactly. if you had to go, you know, fix something valuable in your house. You wouldn't do that if something was really wrong with your kid, you know, then you would take them and rush into the emergency room by the time it's too late. You know, it's like you have to start to trust people that are there for your own benefit and good. You know, as we talk about our communities and how uh, we want to better our communities, you know, we really need to hear from our doctors to say, you know, you can trust us. We are here. You can trust us. As you said, do your own research um, so that we are supporting um, our own doctors, but, you know, getting um, information that we need from us by us. I also wanted to um, bring up my own personal journey um, as a mom. I um, on World Prematurity Day. I was a NICU mom. Uh, I delivered early. I had a couple of different things that were going on, but uh, to your point, you called yourself the fibroid slayer. But I delivered early because um, of fibroids. And at that point in time, everyone said it was the black women's disease and that, you know, fibroids are rampant um, in, in the black community, especially with black women. So um, talk a little bit about um, what you're seeing now um, in terms of um, your patients um, and black women and, and fibroids and how that is playing out in terms of um, maternal health um, and during uh, the, the pregnancy journey. The misconception that fibroids only impact black women is wrong. Yeah. Right? I mean, it's I, definitely I, wrong. No, it's not, it's not just you, but that's just the concept. Why, why don't it affect black women? It, yeah. it really doesn't. So fibroids impact 80% of African American women, but they also impact 70% of the general population. The bigger difference, and it goes back to what we were talking about before, it's about access and it's about trust in the system right so because black women have um, been brutalized you know over centuries in this country because in 2022 the number of hysterectomies is still two-thirds more in red southern states as opposed to the north right mm -hmm. racism still exists disparities still exist in healthcare. so with that being said you can look at the time of when Someone that's not black goes to see a doctor and gets things addressed versus the time, you know, black women typically go and see things. I, I have women that literally have fibroids that are growing out of their neck almost literally, just physically, but um, that are just fibroid disease that's advanced. Um, that, that by the time you come in, yeah, you've been played with it for years and years and years, but you should have went to the doctor like a long time ago. But again, that looks at all of these different things that contribute you know, to the delay in care. Okay. Um, yeah. So ideally, and this is in the perfect world when everybody has access, you would know before you got pregnant if you had five girls. Mm -hmm. And they would be addressed before pregnancy happens. Um, a lot of my patients are young women under the age of 30. So the incidence of the incidence of fibroids increases the older you get. So in my pregnant patients, I honestly don't have a lot that have fibroids because of my pregnant population in my office, they're very young, so they don't have them. But I do tell them, if they do to address them, I will say this, I have several patients in their 70s who have fibroids 
and didn't take care of them. And now they're in their 70s and they're concerned and, and they need to be addressed surgically at this point. There's no other um, management other than some type of surgery. And it gets scary for women having to get put to sleep in their 70s over certain ages. Mm -hmm. So while I cannot address, I can't address, but I don't have that much experience with young women pregnant with fibroids. The older women who have the fibroids and the doctors told them, oh, just wait, they'll shrink, wait, they'll go away. Mm -hmm. It's, um, it doesn't always happen like that. And now they're 75. Mm -hmm. And you can, I'm sure you can speak to this. And so with that being said, and it's, 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 it's really about education and about understanding that every person is different and all fibroids are not created equal. So for your case, Absolutely. your case is your case is extreme. Yeah. Um, but for eighty percent of women that of black women that have fibroids, we don't have to have eight out of ten and get a hysterectomy or myomectomies or those types of things. So it really just depends case by case where your fibroids are located and how and how big they are. Right. So if you have a fibroid that's you know excessively large and or is pushing into the cavity of the uterus, then it, then it needs to be addressed. However. If you don't have that, you can have a perfectly normal, healthy pregnancy and deliver without any complications, per se. So um, it's really a conversation, you know, with your doctor, ultrasounds, and, and really to map out if you are a candidate for, or you, if this could potentially be a problem to be addressed. And that comes with access and comes with being able to detect if there, you know, are, are issues early. Um, and that's where the problem is at. Mm -hmm. Thank you uh, for sharing that. Um, yeah, I went through a very scary journey. Um, delivered early. I was a Mickey mom for, for six weeks. And so from that, um, there were a lot of, um, you know, health challenges um, that had to be um, addressed. But, you know, um, being on the lucky side and um, being able to go through that, um, I have learned to be uh, appreciative of very knowledgeable and being under the care of um, excellent doctors. Um, so, um, on more premature today, you know, that's something that's um, super important. Dr. Johnson, uh, we will not leave this conversation without um, breaching the topic that I know you um, are very passionate about. I know you have a high Instagram following, and so you um, are very known for um, expressing your thoughts and opinions. And so, I um, wanted to ask you specifically, what, what are your thoughts around Roe versus Wade? So Roe versus Wade really overturning is just just a political chess game, um, and unfortunately, the the politics of it is is you know, chess is playing people's lives mm -hmm. at the end of the day. Because as a physician, I'm not paid to make policy, right? I'm, I'm there to save lives, take care of people, mm -hmm. and as a politician, politicians should not be allowed to make medical decisions or. Um, dictate how doctors practice and how they care for patients as well um, and it goes more into an in-depth look at the fabric of our country and how medicine has been weaponized on black people like for centuries mm -hmm. um, and this is really no different and so when you look at um, the option of not even an option but if you look at um, abortion in its totality, it's not just ending life, right? It's, it's, there are medical indications for um, abortion that people that don't practice medicine have no con concept about. Um, you know, a story, you know, that I share with people, like I had a, um, I had a patient, she had a delivery and after her delivery, she was, you know, waiting for this child for a long, extensive period of time. Um, had a delivery, and after that, she um, experienced something called postpartum cardiomyopathy, which is a heart condition um, in which the heart becomes enlarged and does not eject blood at a proficient rate. And her postpartum cardiomyopathy was so so extensive that it caused extensive heart damage for her, mm -hmm. to the point where she had an ejection fraction like in the teens, which is like near death. And so this woman had to walk around with a machine that was helping pump her heart, right? To help pump blood out of her heart. For her, if she gets pregnant, she'll die. So f for someone to tell me that if this woman gets pregnant, that she has to keep this pregnancy 
and risk her life and pretty much ultimately die, she has like an 80 to 90% chance of dying from that, mm -hmm. is criminal. It's past, you know, going into politics, it's, it's to a point where you're causing death to innocent people. And so with that being said, it's not enough of a physician or medical input into this decision that's happening um, and you're going to have, you know, carnage from it. Um, I, I think that, you know, it's, it's definitely going to be something that's going to be um, significantly changed in the future. I don't think at, at all that this is going to um, be effective for the long term. What's going to happen, what's going to happen is somebody significant is going to have a major okay. um, issue, whether it be a celebrity, a politician, or, you know, there are politicians right now that have had abortions that are on the front lines picketing against abortion. So it's like, you know, when it, when it impacts your home, then you want to do something about it. Unless, if it's not at your front door, you know, you're 50, 60 years old, you're not going to have any children anymore, you don't have to worry about your kids or anybody else, and you can make decisions for other people that doesn't impact your home, you're comfortable making that decision. Or if it is a decision that's going to allow you to get into some political office or get into some higher up in um, status, then you're comfortable with the decision. Um, but in practicality, as far as what it will do for multitudes, we've already heard um, you know, some horror stories of, of things that have happened already. You know, and um, you know, and goodness gracious, physicians are actually um, now being, you know, risking their freedom and livelihood because they're practicing medicine. It's just a travesty. It doesn't make any sense whatsoever. So, I mean, that's my take on I can talk about it all day. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm glad we, we needed to hear that, right. not from you, especially from um, a male doctor, a male perspective. Right. I think it speaks volumes. Um, so, I just want I to protect say, black women. Yes, thank you for <laughs> protecting the black woman. Um, so, I want to say thank you very much to um, Dr. Pierre Johnson, who is um, our brother of Omega Sci Fi Fraternity Incorporated from New Pi Chapter, as well as my sore Dr. Vanessa Foster, who is also a member of the Chicago Metropolitan Alumni Chapter, for sharing with us um, this evening on World Prematurity Day. And so um, we thank you for joining us, but we also want to make sure that you understand that tonight um, it's all about the common love story, but it's also in support of the March of Dimes. And so we hope that you join us in supporting the March of Dimes by donating um, and supporting our chapters because that's what World Prematurity Day is all about. Thank you. Today, November 17th, 2022, Omegas around the world are celebrating their 111th anniversary of the founding of Omega Sci-Fi Fraternity Incorporated. And it is also World Prematurity Day. The Chicago Metropolitan Alumni Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated and the New Pi Chapter of Omega Sci-Fi Fraternity Incorporated stand in solidarity and support of healthy moms and healthy babies around the world. As we celebrate the love of our founders, Frank and Edna Coleman, join us and donate for the advancement of research and legislative advocacy for the health and wellness of preterm babies. Coleman Love didn't just stop at Frank and Edna. Omega founder Edgar Love married charter member of Queens alumni chapter Virginia Ross Love hence the play on words, Coleman Love. Coleman Love has been a term that many have used, but never really truly understood the meaning. So we asked our couples to tell us what Coleman Love means to them and how they would like to see the legacy of Coleman Love in the future. Coleman Love really is the epitome of a love story where two amazing, well-educated, um, people found love with each other. They helped us to understand what love was as it relates to being a part of a fraternity and a sorority that really shares a lot of the same values. I love everything about him. I love that he's a Q. I love that I'm a Delta. I love that we do things to support each other and that's really what it's about. Where we are, I would say even today, I think, you know, I look at her as my best friend. I look at her as someone that I can tell anything to. You know, I look at her as, hey, this is the mother of my children. 
which we love our kids, you know, and we had to learn how to appreciate the differences between the two of us and honor those differences and support them. I know what she does, what she's good at. She knows what I'm good at. I, you know, I let her lead when I need to. She lets me lead when I need to. So it's that balance that we've had to figure out over the years. It was brought to us as a bond between two African-American students at the same university. I'd, I'd love to see it grow. I think we're kind of like on the same level in regards to service to the community. Uh, I think we're on the same level in regards to what I consider our blackness. Um, I've always believed in a, a good woman with a, with, with a man helps him mature. With that strong woman behind us makes us become great. I think that would increase if we can keep the Coleman love thing intact. Not necessarily a love story, but a story that's created, that a bond was created from. Okay, but it is important that everybody understands the establishment of it. Represents uh, before they started uh, using the term black excellence uh, more recently than that was kind of a predecessor to today's black excellence on both ends of the relationship. I thought it was very interesting to know that she was valedictorian and, and class president um, at Howard University you know, um, Alpha Chapter, starting Alpha Chapter, and just that excellence of what, you know, Elliot is saying. It really was like, wow, these were two people that found each other and created a bond, and that it's called marriage. You hope that you continue that, that path of continuous love, you know, and they did. You don't necessarily know the true story of it. Right, and you know, you just hear calm and love. You thinking, oh, just the bros and the Reds, the Deltas, and the Qs getting together, and that's what you know you think of it as. And that was kind of the foundational understanding of it. Prior to us even having this conversation, I think that I was very, very new and naive to what it truly meant as a beautiful sisterhood um, that, that I, I, I get to wake up to every morning. The brotherhood and the, and the friendship that we. Have. And I think when you bring those both together, there's a beautiful protection. There's a eye awakening of like, you're good. You know, the story, the meaning, you understand how special that bond truly was, is. As yeah. members of the very best organizations, it's like the cherry on top of our love. Well, like, we had a good relationship with the bros. It's always been a very sisterly, brotherly relationship. The bros would be like, come eat, like, the, all, the bros always gonna feed you. That's one thing, you're not gonna starve with the bros. <laughs> you know, I came home with those same feelings um, of love and admiration towards the bros. A lot of our founding charter members were either related to each other or they married each other. Beta Kai, Beta Kappa has always had a family bond from the get-go. Like homecoming, we would set the tent up, we have our tent, our grill. The Delsons would come and sit up right next to us and provide everything else. You know, we could, it's, it's, it's just like a, it was like a husband, like husband-wife relationship. We cook, we barbecue it, bring the they bring the sides. <laughs> Throughout the years, Frank never forgot Edna, even after he remarried. Frank would post a tribute every year in the local newspaper on the anniversary of her death. And that's the true Coleman love story.